The meeting in Marseille uh, represents yet another stage in, I would say, a 15-year process by which we see the private sector trying to uh, control water for profit and the progressive movement figuring out how, first of all, to stop that, but second of all, how to meet the needs of all citizens and increasingly of the environment uh, in water and sanitation. So we've got uh, an ongoing many year process of uh, basically conflict of different perspectives. Um, Marseille is uh, emblematic because we're coming uh, back to the home of the beast. We're coming into the lair. Uh, this is where it all started with the World Bank and Suez and Veolia. Uh, so to come here now uh, is very important. It's also very important for mobilizing the, uh, the left in France. Um, because what we're seeing is a rollback of the privatizations. With Paris being the most uh, visible, uh, the most symbolic, but we're seeing it happening in big cities and small, uh, in even some rural areas. Um, and this is fundamental uh, for not only the movement in France, but globally, because this is the belly of the beast. Um, what we're seeing that's different now is the connection between uh, the Conference of the Parties, Durban, climate change, Rio plus 20, and Marseille is right in the middle. And what we're seeing, I think, is, first of all, there's no more attempt to have the 25, 30 year concession contracts where the private sector operates for its own profit. Those are gone. We've defeated those. But what we're seeing now is going to be much more dangerous. And this comes under the whole green economy uh, concept where in order to appropriately distribute all of the natural resources of the planet in a responsible way, we need this concept of stewardship. And stewardship is a concept that says, I will take care of this, not for myself, but for the future generations. And what we're seeing in the green economy negotiations, because again, this is, we can move from concepts, but concepts end up being implemented as a result of power relations not as a result of ideology or good ideas. It's all about who's got the muscle here. And what we're extremely concerned about is, for example, in water, we're seeing not only Suez and Veolia trying to save their profit margins, we're seeing Nestle, Coca-Cola, and the drinks and food. We're seeing Archer Daniel Midlands, ADM, Cargill, Monsanto, uh, the ones who uh, basically are supplying the materials for the agricultural sector. We're seeing Shell, we're seeing Exxon, we're seeing RWE, the energy boys, and ADF, amongst others, because they need water for cooling. If they can't cool their uh, reactors or their uh, thermal power stations, they can't run. Uh, we're seeing uh, the, the International Hydropower Association. So what we're seeing is rather than just Suez and Veolia, we're seeing a whole range of extremely powerful corporations. And what I'm worried about, and uh, a number of uh, people are, are taking a look at, is that we're going to see that the market dynamics are put into access to resources and access to, to, to water in a different way. We've heard of the right to water, but we're also going to be talking about water rights. Now, water rights is a different concept, which means if I own a piece of land, the water underneath that land is mine, and I get to do with it what I want. So I have the right to that water, and I can sell those rights. And this we see, the, the, one of the, the worst examples was T. Boone Pickens in the United States, uh, in the South, where they have uh, serious problems of water, but they have very hungry crops, water-hungry crops uh, for export, um, who speculates on water rights and wants to trade water rights. And from what I gather, uh, the US government is endorsing that position. Uh, Australia is trying that as a way to manage its scarce resources in its water dry areas. So in, in terms of water, I think we have to be extremely uh, vigilant about this new move under the green economy. Uh, we have to link up with the agricultural because this whole concept of how do we feed a planet of 9 billion 
uh, leads to uh, this uh, notion of efficiency. So we have to use water efficiently. What that means is basically the big agro industry groups say we're more efficient at producing more crop per drop. So all of you subsistence or smallholder farmers, you're gone. We will collectivize the farms <laughs> in a neo-Stalinist form <laughs> and we will control uh, agriculture. Fine, we'll be doing monocrops, we'll be doing uh, heavy fertilizer and all of those industrial vertically integrated processes, but we're going to see uh, under this concept of efficient use much more push towards industry. Um, but also uh, we've got to make the link to land grabbing. And this is where we're seeing uh, water scarce countries actually moving their sovereign wealth funds uh, and buying up huge pieces of land in Africa, for example, or in Latin America. So it's not only sovereign wealth funds, uh, it's also uh, industrialists, but it is a political process of displacing people who have been using these lands for hundreds of generations, perhaps as pastoralists. They will now be displaced and there will be a new process of enclosures which we saw in, in the UK where the, the commons were being destroyed and privatized. Um, so we have to, in Marseille, as the progressive movement, we have to expand our horizons. Now, what does this mean for the workers? Uh, there's a couple of files for the workers that are uh, very important. The one process I mentioned at the outset was the remunicipalization where you go from private management back to public. And that presents a big challenge for the workers because you're asking them to change their terms and conditions of employment. And any time you're asking us to change our terms and conditions, you bring in massive uncertainty. And this is something we don't like to do. We don't like uncertainty about our jobs because guess what? We are certain that we have to pay our bills. We are certain we have to feed our families. And so you're asking us, because of a, a political process, to bring uncertainty into our livelihoods? Ah. So what we will be doing is a, a significant process to examine what, from the workers' perspective, do, do we need to see in the remunicipalization process. That's, that's one core area. But the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to go to Rio Plus 20. And we're going to say, even though we know that the governments don't want to do anything, because there's elections in France, in the USA, there's elections here, there, and everywhere. So none of the governments wants to be seen to do anything except maybe start another war, Iran. But other than that, they, they don't want to make any new commitments in, uh, in Rio. So first of all, we agree with a number in the UN that we don't want to lose anything from the first Rio summit. No givebacks on the principles of sustainable development. Second of all, we have to say that the three pillars, the social, and, uh, ecological, and economic, must move together. But what we're saying, given that with climate change, with the financial crisis, with all of these uh, new and threatening um, dynamics, what we need to do is to ensure that families don't pay the cost, which is what's happening. Look at what's happening in Greece, in Portugal. Look what's happening in countries all around the world. It's the families who are paying. It's not the rich. The rich don't pay. So what we're doing in conjunction with the ILO, the International Labor Organization, is looking at a concept called the social protection floor. To say, in order for a family to be able to adapt to all this stuff that's happening, we need to see some basic minimum criteria, universal. And this includes access to water, electricity, to education, to justice. These things should be a given. They should be guaranteed for all. And basically what our position in PSI is, these are essential public services that all governments must provide to all of the people that live in their countries, uh, whether citizens or migrants, it has to be done. It's only in that way that we can have, that we can move forward on the basis of justice and equity. And in that way, 
uh, we will deal with, because the role of public services is to redistribute the wealth of the country, we'll be able to deal with this massive growing inequality. Because if we don't deal with it, there's going to be more violence. If we don't deal with it, there's going to be more riots and eventually revolutions and governments will fall. So we've got to move forward on a basis that allows families to live in dignity and equity everywhere. And that we hope that uh, fame uh, in Marseille will be one step and then Rio and that's what we're building for the future.